I'm delighted to be here and to try to give you a sense of one of the most interesting objects that we know in the universe, a neutron star, which we see from Earth as a pulsar. And I'll try to give you some feeling for how that came about. But what I want to do also is to tell you how we develop theories in physics and theories in science generally and to illustrate how this works. In the process, in order to appreciate how remarkable a neutron star is, we need to talk about what matter is made of. We need to talk about both what's down here, the terrestrial zoo of elementary particles, and we need to talk about what's up there, the celestial zoo. We'll then turn to pulsars, talk about their discovery and how they were identified as rotating neutron stars, and then look inside a neutron star and discuss how one was able to get a feeling for what a star is made of, and in particular, for the fact that they are mostly made up of superfluid neutrons. In the process, I would like to introduce you to the topic of superconductivity and superfluidity generally, and we'll just do that as we go along. Let me encourage you to ask questions as I go, and I'll stop at a couple of points and really demand that you think of some kind of question to ask. It's, it's, uh, my feeling about almost any lecture is that it's improved by taking a pause and it's improved a lot. You really feel involved with the lecturer rather than simply sitting there. It's hard to do in a large group. It's easier, it would be easier if there were four or five of us. On the other hand, it's much more fun to have a chance to tell something like 75 of you what we're going to do in understanding neutron stars. How does a scientific theory evolve? Well, you saw a very good example in what David Herzog has just been telling you about. You discover something new, or you observe something new. If you're working on Earth, it's a discovery. On the other hand, if you're looking up in the sky, then you're really only able to observe whatever it is nature is putting on for you. The same is true, by the way, if you're trying to work in the social sciences. You can't control a large society, a large group of people. You can only observe what they do and try to figure out what's going on. So you've discovered something new, you've observed something new. You then start thinking, well, what could have caused that? You can say, you try to develop a scenario for what's going on, a possible explanation. And in science, you do typically the simplest thing you can, what we call a back of the envelope calculation. That means no computer, not even a slide rule or a calculator. Rather, it means something you could do with high school arithmetic to get a sense of what might be involved with the physical phenomena. You go on from that to then say, based on your knowledge of existing physical laws and what the universe is made of, you then may go on to some kind of mathematical description, or you may try a computer simulation to test which of your possible scenarios works. And apparently what distinguishes the really remarkable scientists from just your average, very good scientists is the ability to keep a number of different scenarios in mind at the same time. In other words, not commit to a particular point of view. Keep, always keep your mind open as you're looking at new phenomena and pursue alternative possibilities if possible, as far as you can go before making a commitment to saying, yeah, this has got to be it. And then you start your detailed calculations. Now, the test of whether you've done something right is whether you can understand existing experiments 
one, or observations, and two, can you predict something? Can you predict something that hasn't been observed or hasn't been measured in the lab? And the basic assumption that you make when you're working in astrophysics is that you have the same building blocks and the same laws of physics applying everywhere in the universe. That's a bold assumption, but it simplifies matters greatly because if you think about it for a minute, you would say, well, if I can invent a new law for every new thing I see up there, I'm probably not making much progress. And indeed, I'm probably setting science back rather than forward. So what you always try to do is to explain phenomena in the simplest way, using laws you know about, and then only if you're desperate and nothing else works, you then try to say, OK, one of the existing laws is, for one reason or another, not working. Now, I think you've probably already heard something about the basic building blocks of matter in the terrestrial zoo, what we have on Earth. But let me remind you of these. One has, first of all, I'm going to start with the tiny things. One has electrons. And you were looking at the flow of electrons in Professor Herzog's demonstration. These have a charge. They also have something called a spin, a basic unit of angular momentum. Angular momentum is the, a measure of how rapidly you spin about something. And we'll come back to it. But what's fantastic about these tiny little objects, electrons, is they have such a spin. And it plays a very important role in determining their properties. Their mass is tiny. I've introduced you there to the form of notation which scientists use all the time, which is powers of 10. So 10 to the 0 is 1. 10 to the 1 is 10. 10 to the power 2 is 100, and so on. How many of you are familiar with the, the scientific notation of powers of 10? OK. Those of you who aren't, learn it today. Try to learn it today, <coughs> and then see if you can reproduce some of the simple estimates that I give. Why we do powers of 10. It's very 27. That means putting a 1 on top, and then writing out 10, 1 followed by 26 zeros below. It takes a lot of time. You haven't really learned anything in the process other than how to make zeros quickly. Uh, perhaps, but limited in its applicability. Uh, what about the size of an electron, which is clearly, you know, it's beyond thinking in terms of things we pick up and weigh. Put it another way, and a rather light object that you pick up has 10 to the 27th electrons in it. That's a gram. You know, that's a small part of a kilogram, that's 1,000 grams, and a kilogram is uh, 2.2 pounds. So that gives you a measure where so then it's got 2.2 times 10 to the 27th times 1,000, so 10 to the 30th electrons in it. Good. What about the size? The size of an electron is quite small. It's measured in units of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. And that was named Fermi in honor of Enrico Fermi, the great uh, experimental and theoretical physicist who devoted his life to understanding nuclear physics, particularly. And uh, the natural unit for nuclear physics is the Fermi. Uh, the, that brings us to what is the heart and so nuclear physics, the protons and the neutrons, which are the basic constituents of nuclei, these again are bit heavy compared to electrons. They're each about 1,840 times heavier than an electron. So we say roughly rounding off, they have masses of the order of 2 times 10 to the minus 
Their size again is about a family. Now you take a collection of the, the protons and the neutrons are essentially the same, except the proton has a positive charge and the neutron is neutral. Uh, the basic building blocks of nuclei were discovered in the period of 1913 up through the mid-20s, culminating in the discovery of the neutron in 1932. So these are not concepts that were around in the 19th century at the time that people were discovering electricity and magnetism and the forces between coils of wire and magnets. A nucleus, which is the heart of an atom, then is made up of some Z protons and some A minus Z neutrons, so it has a total mass A, and its mass then is something like 2A times 10 to the minus 24th grams. And it's bigger because typically it has then a lot of these tinier objects, neutrons and protons in it. So the sizes of order 10 families. It consists in a nucleus at its center, a set of electrons moving around it. How many of you have heard lectures on atoms? Pretty experienced group. Great. How many of you understood the lecture about atoms? Fantastic. Okay, we're off and running. For those of you who didn't, I'm not sure this lecture is going to help except to reinforce the names, which is important. So you're not frightened of something when you see it again. Say, Adam, well, I've heard about those before. Those are the basic building blocks of the matter that we deal with in everyday life. They're big because the electrons are sitting there way outside the nucleus around. The basic size of an atom is measured in angstroms. That's 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So one, divi uh, one divided by 10 followed by seven zeros. Uh, but they, on the other hand, are giant compared to the basic constituents, the neutrons, protons, nuclei, and electrons. They're of order 100,000 times bigger. How do these objects interact? Because if you've got an object, it interacts. The common force that we all know about is gravity. What holds me fixed? standing on this floor, rather than if I were a spaceship floating about. So gravity is always present. With all objects that possess mass, then interact gravitationally, but they don't interact very strongly. And the masses are attracted to each other, and that force goes inversely as the distance. It's just a very weak force, Compared to the electromagnetic force, or the electrostatic force, which is the force between a pair of electrons going inversely as the distance between Forces change character entirely if you look at the new uh, the way of describing the interactions between neutrons and protons. They're a mix. They're attractive at long distances, and that's why I have the topic that I I'm going to give you today of superfluid neutrons. The superfluidity comes from that long distance attraction. On the other hand, they're very repulsive at short distances. So I've sketched there about what that looks like then, a long distance attraction, a short distance repulsion. But remember, the distance scales here are of order Fermi's. On the other hand, both the electromagnetic or electrostatic interaction and the gravitational interaction have a very long range. Well, what's up there? What's up there is the sun, our nearest star, responsible for all of us. It's got nuclei and electrons at very high temperatures. It's big, 2 times 10 to the 33 grams. Quick calculation, okay, I've got the 27th electrons 
in a gram, then the sun must have something like two times 60th electrons in it. Big object, as we know. Radius, about 10 to the 11th centimeters, 10 to the 6th kilometers. Uh, how did I, uh, and that, again, it's convenient to measure astronomical objects in kilometers. That saves writing a whole set of factors of 10. Kilometer being 10 to the 5th centimeters, 1,000 meters. The Earth, by comparison, has the temperatures we know about. It has a collection of atoms. And it has a mass much smaller, about a, 1 over 10 million times the mass of the sun. And its size is 5,000 kilometers. The average density in the Earth is not that much greater than the average density in the sun, about twice as dense. You go then to the various other kinds of stars and celestial objects that make up the celestial zoo, and they are the so-called white dwarfs. These were stars that were visible, but which did not seem to be putting out very much light. And the reason is they're a lot smaller. They are just about twice as big in radius as the Earth, yet they have a mass of the order of the sun. So they're clearly a great deal more dense than the Earth, and their density is typically a million times greater than the density of matter on Earth. But now we change orders of magnitude entirely. We go up another factor of about a billion when we go to a neutron star. It has mostly neutrons, a few electrons, a few protons, a few nuclei in its outer crust. Its mass is a little greater than that of the sun. Typically, most neutron stars seem to have a mass of about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. It's tiny. It's the size of Champaign-Urbana in terms of its radius. It's 10 kilometers, 6 miles across, 10 miles across. The density, then, must be fantastic, and it is. Its density is 3 times 10 to the 14th grams per centimeter cubed. Now, these are very hard numbers to, to think about, but you can think about it in the following way. Suppose you took the Earth and you squeezed it until it had the same density as a neutron star. You would wind up with an object the size of a ping pong ball. Even more dramatic. If you took all the people on Earth and squeezed them until they had the you would wind up with a raindrop. Pretty dense stuff. It's why I can't do a lecture demonstration by bringing in a piece of a star, because it would be a little bit heavy. In fact, I couldn't hold it. It would drop right through the Earth, bounce up and down, and so forth. And it's also why you can't climb little mountains on a neutron star. They're a quarter of a meter, you know, a, a, a yard, tiny. Yet you cannot, even the best mountain climber around, assuming that he or she could live in that kind of gravity, could not possibly climb that mountain because you're over, t you're having to overcome such an intense gravitational field. given you most of the material on that transparency. Just want to say, you know, that the neutron stars are way out. That a typical pulsar is, its distance is measured in light years. That's the amount of time it takes light to travel, which travels at 186,000 miles an hour. That's the amount of time it takes the light to reach us from the pulsar. So you say that these are hundreds of light years away, and a quick calculation says, oh, that's of the order of two billion million miles away. It's far away. Okay. So they are, 
that matter is so dense, it is the most dense form of matter of the universe. There is still more dense matter out there, you simply can't look at its properties. That more dense matter is what you'll hear about from Professor Seidel in January, those are the black holes. A black hole, as we'll see in a minute, is made in the same way that a neutron star is. If you like, it's the failure of the system to make a neutron star that leads to the formation of a black hole. And the density in a neutron star is even denser than the matter found inside atomic nuclei, about twice that or three times that. Scientific discovery. How did neutron stars get discovered? Well, they were proposed in a systematic way, in the following sense. The neutron was discovered. And the story goes that the great Soviet theoretical physicist Lev Davidovich, who was visiting Copenhagen, was at the house of Niels Bohr, the great Danish theoretical physicist, in 1932 when word came of the discovery of the neutron. And Landau immediately said, ha, huh, if they're neutrons, there probably are stars made of them. So that was the first use of the word neutron stars. Landau was interested in stars and how they formed, had, how, what was the source of energy in a star and so forth. So it's not amazing that he was thinking along these lines, but he was pretty quick. Even more remarkably, two uh, Caltech astronomers, Walter Bade and Fritz Zwicky, two years later, made a, what I would call an even stronger prophecy. They were studying supernovae, which we'll come to in a Remarkable explosions of light in our sky. And they said, hmm, maybe supernovae represent the birth of a neutron star. And that maybe also the resulting object is the source of cosmic rays. Both of those guesses, and that they could only be guesses, turned out to be correct. So these people were real prophets. The first serious calculations that were done on whether you could have an object like a neutron star and how it might work were done by the theoretical physicist Robert Oppenheimer. Have you all heard of Oppenheimer? Okay, you know about him because he was director of the Manhattan Project, which made the atomic bomb. And a remarkably gifted scientist in every conceivable way. Uh, I happen to have been a beginning student of his in Berkeley right after the war. And as students, we would talk about the fact that here was this amazingly brilliant scientist who didn't seem to have done anything that would get him a Nobel Prize, that being regarded as the ultimate accolade in science. Well, we were wrong, we just didn't understand. He had done it. He had done it with his work on neutron stars and on black holes. It's just that he was so far ahead of his time that he didn't live long enough to be recognized with the Nobel Prize. By the way, the reason he's not around today was that he smoked a very great deal, two or three packs a day, and he died of lung cancer at a rather early age as a result. Oppenheimer is the one who put flesh on this proposal about neutron stars, but still there seemed no real likelihood that was, one was going to observe it. Again, a further prophet was the theoretical physicist Franco Pacini, who said, well, if you have neutron stars, maybe they have magnetic fields, and that will give rise to the possibility of some observable phenomena. So another prophet. Given the intense gravitational field associated with such a compact object, how could it be stable? Uh, indeed, you ought to start asking that question. How, after all, is the Earth stable? What keeps us all together? The 
answer is that atoms don't, in a solid, don't like to be squeezed. So you've got a kind of atomic gravitational attraction. What supplies the pressure there? You've got gravity, which is pulling everything in, but the star is quite hot. So the radiation. determines the size of a star. <coughs> uh, the thermonuclear reactions are what releases the energy and keeps the star from collapsing. But that's another story. White dwarfs, that's a compact star. Here you have a quite different process balancing the gravitational attraction. You know, the, the, a star the size of the sun has got to have that size because only then is the radiation pressure strong enough to balance the force of gravity. If you want to get something much tinier, then clearly radiation pressure can't do the job. What does the job is the fact that a white dwarf is mostly made up of electrons. These electrons can have a spin and you can only put two of them into what is called the same quantum state. And so as you build up a dense system of electrons, then you have automatically a resistance to squeezing the electrons too much. That's called degeneracy pressure, and it's the degeneracy of the electrons which is balancing gravity that makes the white dwarf work. From that, it's not a big leap of faith to think about what balances things for a neutron star. You just say, well, now, because neutron stars also have a spin and obey this Pauli exclusion principle that no neutron, two neutrons can be in the same place in the same time if they've got the same spin, then you say, all right, the neutron degeneracy can pressure can balance gravity. And that is what makes the stability of the neutron star. Those were the calculations that Oppenheimer did with his students before the war. Those were the calculations that said, if a neutron star is too massive, the degeneracy pressure can't do the job. So there is a maximum mass for a neutron star. And if you try to put more mass onto it, say accrete mass on mass neutron star, voila, you get a black hole. So the black holes actually contain the most dense matter in the universe. It's just we can't look inside them. The definition of a black hole is that no signal can escape its gravitational field. It has a gravitational field so strong that it tries to send a signal out. The signal simply gets bent back onto the black hole. So you only learn indirectly about black holes from what goes on outside a black hole. How did neutron stars get born? Well, again, Bode and Zwicky guessed it. They get born in the collapse of a massive star. You take a star, eight solar masses, say. It has a core as thermal uh, nuclear evolution proceeds it develops a core that's more and more massive, and it's a core rather like a hot, degenerate white dwarf. The core then goes unstable at some point in the life of the star. So the core collapses. You've got then, most of the mass of the star is just sitting there, and the internal part, the core, has collapsed, this tiny little part inside. It collapses until the pressure, the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons and protons takes over. For a hot star, that's a pressure, that means it's got a size of around 30 kilometers. Not very big. Uh, the other stuff is sitting out there. What happens then is that gravity is trying to drive stuff in. You've got this pressure building up and building up, you get an explosion. The core collapse then sends out an enormous shock wave which drives the outside matter away. 
Now, if it's successful in driving the outside matter away, you wind up with a neutron for solar masses. If it fails, the mass just comes pouring back over time, you know, within a few minutes, in fact, onto the neutron star. That's the end of the neutron star and the beginning of the life of that object as a black hole. It's very touch and go, and we still don't know how to calculate in detail how that process takes place. In fact, if it were up to the theoretical astrophysicists, you would not have neutron stars. You'd only wind up with black holes. Now, how did such a tiny object get discovered by accident? Two Cambridge University astronomers were in 1967 looking with an enormous radio telescope of four wave dipoles, 2048, uh, looking at the sky. Were they looking for pulsars, for neutron stars? No. They were studying scintillation. They were looking at radio objects, which on passing through interstellar, intergalactic matter, reached the Earth. But because they are perturbed by signals, you know, the signal bounces up and down a little. That's what they were studying. Uh, the student working on the project was a woman named Jocelyn Bell. She came to her research supervisor and said, something unusual seems to be going on. I seem to be getting the pattern shown there, a pattern of regular pulses of about 20 milliseconds in duration occurring at 0.22 second intervals. OK, what made a discovery? What you do, first of all, as a cautious scientist, is say, what objects are there in my laboratory that are producing signal at this frequency? So you make an intense search to be sure there's nothing out there causing it. Incidentally, Jocelyn Bell was quite sure she'd found something new. It was her supervisor who was worried that it was some conventional disturbance. He had to work very hard to get his continued attention to the fact that this was worth paying attention to. Uh, next, you consider the fact that that signal is coming from a group of LGMs, little green men. And the people seriously thought at Cambridge for a while about the fact that the discovery was the first indication of extraterrestrial indication, intelligence. Why did they reject it? Uh, the main reason, I think, is that upon reflection, anyone up there smart enough to be communicating with us, they wouldn't communicate in such regular fashion. They would try to send information in one way or another. It wouldn't just be beep, 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 beep. They try to signal, they try to say something. Okay, LGM is out. Then rather quickly, people pursued the possibility that it was a rotating neutron star. And the argument goes something like this. If you think about that collapse process that I showed you, object that the core, which I showed you, rotates because everything in the universe does rotate a bit. The sun rotates. Everything rotates. Spins, rotates. Then when it collapses, angular momentum is conserved. It's the same, you know, when you are skating on the ice, you have your hands out. You have a lot of angular momentum. When you then draw your hands in, you spin up. You go a lot faster. That means that you have conserved your angular momentum. Speed, speed up. Try it the next time on an ice rink. Probably if you ice skate, you've done this already. Well, the same is true for the core of that massive star. So when that core shrinks, then you get a very rapid speed of rotation, which could be as rapid as 1 over six, uh, 600 times a second the millisecond neutron star, a millisecond pulsar. At the same time, in the same way, something called magnetic flux. You take the magnetic fields 
that David Herzog was telling you about, you apply, you take the strength of that field, multiply its strength by the radius, the size of the field, essentially, you get something called magnetic flux. That is also conserved. So that means that this prototype neutron star made in the collapse will then be both rotating very fast. So it could be the period that you see was that period of rotation. But it also has an extraordinary, super strong magnetic field, about 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 13th times bigger than that associated with the dynamo producing the field on the Earth. So that's the essence of how a pulsar works then. The star rotates, it possesses a very large magnetic field, and you can show that rotation plus a magnetic field gives you a big electrical field. In fact, we almost had it in David's lecture demonstration. That will pull charged particles from the surface of the star. And a, a pulsar then is a natural particle accelerator. What we see is these beams of charged particles, which excite beams of electromagnetic radiation. That's a very poor drawing there. There's the star rotating about this axis. There's the magnetic field. There are beams coming out of the magnetic poles where the electric field is most intense. And then what we see, as this whole thing is rotating around, we get a lighthouse effect, and what we pick up are, is the pulse signal from the neutron star. There's a lot of energy there. It can be as large as 10,000 times the uh, energy of the sun. It's a very efficient system, this conversion of energy of the star into electromagnetic energy, and what it does is to cause the star to slow down. Now I come to the issue of superfluidity. Uh, most pulsars are great clocks. They're extraordinarily accurate. You can measure their period to a few parts in hundreds of millions. And they rival atomic terrestrial clocks in their accuracy. And so you can measure time of arrivals very well. And they, they, they walked, people were very excited the first few, first year or so after pulsars. It looked like these were the most stable clocks around. And then lo and behold, one of them glitched. In March 1969, the pulsar in the Vela constellation had a glitch. And it didn't do any things by halves. It changed its period by a few parts in a million. Now, if you stop and think about it, that tells you how accurate those timing observations were, that you can pick up a change of a few parts in a million, because in fact, you're measuring things to nearly one part in a billion. So this jumps out at, a, at you. And in fact, again, the people who discovered this glitch felt something had likely gone wrong with their apparatus. It was such a giant change. And if it hadn't been seen by two groups, people would have argued vociferously about it and would have said, OK, this group of people off in Australia simply didn't get things right. And of course, there was no such thing. But not only does it glitch, it has a fascinating signal afterwards, namely, there is a long time scale associated with the glitch following the, this event, whatever it might be. Uh, and it's the fact that this natural time scale, we're back to back of the arm so long, that led a group of us working that summer in Aspen in 1969 to say, OK, what this pulsar is telling us is that it has a superfluid interior. And then we began to work hard on the properties of that superfluid interior. Now, it's getting late, but I wanted to find these terms for you, although I won't have a chance to really give a detailed picture of how we developed uh, this, our ideas. But I want to tell you about superconductivity briefly. Uh, 
if you compare what happens with materials, you pass, you put on an electric field, you attach things to a battery. What happens in a wire? Typically, you get a conductor. Electrons flow rather easily, like water through a garden, in response to that electric field. The collisions of the electrons with each other and with the objects in the star are what in the wire are what causes dissipation or heat. Uh, if you have an insulator, you apply the electric field, nothing happens. It's blocked up. It's a block. If you have a superconductor, you apply the electric field, and you, voila, the resistance disappears. It's quite remarkable. Uh, and obviously, a good thing if you want to make magnets by coiling the wires, because that is a magnet that's not going to be dissipating energy. It's going to be around for a long time. So great applications for superconductivity. It was discovered in 1911. It was not understood for 46 years. And the understanding came here at the University of Illinois with the work of John Bardeen and his postdoc Leon Cooper and his graduate student Bob Schrieffer was called the BCS theory. How many of you have heard of John Bardeen? Okay. He's certainly the greatest scientist ever to have worked in the state of Illinois and arguably I think the greatest scientist to have born, been born in this country. He's comparatively unknown is not nearly as well as he might be, but more than any person who's lived in this country, he has changed your life. Because he, first of all, before coming to the University of Illinois, he invented the transistor at Bell Laboratories in 1947. He came to Illinois because the transistor was kind of a sideline for him. What he really wanted to do was solve superconductivity. That was the giant problem. Couldn't work full time on it at Bell, so he came to Urbana and established both the semiconductor lab and the electrical engine. In physics, he put together a group working on superconductivity. I was lucky enough to work with him for two and a half years in the early 1950s. Uh, at the same time, he was a key advisor to Xerox, so he had a big hand in xerography. So if you think about your life today, imagine it without the transistor, imagine it without miniaturization, imagine it without computers, and imagine life without Xerox and the ability to copy things easily. Those are the ways John has changed your life. So he got for, for this work, he received two Nobel Prizes in physics. He was the first person to get two Nobel Prizes in the same field. And his impact on the world of physics was as through the development of the BCS theory as was his impact on your lives in terms of changing the way you go about your daily business. The basic idea I've just tried to sketch here, and I'll conclude rather quickly, the key physical idea is that pairs of electrons or pairs of neutrons, because of an effective attractive interaction, form a single quantum state. And this is the state that flows without any resistance. And if you want to think about it, you can imagine a crowded dance floor. Normally, you've got couples, good dancers. They still bounce into each other as they move around. On the other hand, in a superconductor or a superfluid, these bound pairs move effortlessly in a stair to the nth power. So it, it is that ability of these pairs to move along without any resistance that gives you superconductivity. And it's the superfluidity is simply the neutral analog of superconductivity the ability of a liquid to flow without any resistance. And it's a measure of transfer of ideas from one field to, the, to another that 
on learning, of, on understanding the work of Bourdin, Cooper, and Schrieffer with two colleagues. I happened to go to Copenhagen that summer, and I worked with Owa Bohr and Van Monelson. We immediately made a theory of nuclear superfluidity, and which led, in turn, to the idea of the superfluidity of a neutron star. So this puts it in context, this transparency. Uh, up there are the really high temperature superfluids and superconductors, and they have transition temperatures like a million degrees. Down here are the conventional superconducting metal. One of the more exciting things, probably the most exciting thing in my field of condensed matter physics, has been the discovery of high temperature superconductivity, which has taken you from here up from minus 250 degrees, near absolute zero, up to minus 150 degrees centigrade, and which is still a absolutely fascinating and major scientific puzzle. But, but this gives you the notion of the impact of the ideas that Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer developed. They've affected think about matter in the universe. OK, quick look at a neutron star. It's not very big. It's got an outer crust, which is solid. And when, as you go in of a few hundred meters, you find free neutrons, which turn out to be superfluid, and electrons. And these new, this superfluid neutron is pinned, in many cases, to the crustal nuclei sitting there. And then farther inside, you've got superfluid neutrons, protons, and maybe even more exotic objects. But the challenge to the theorists from 1969 on was how, knowing that's what a neutron star is made of, how do you explain the glitches and the post-glitch behavior? So let me conclude with this. What causes a glitch? The first thing we tried were star quakes, analogous to earthquakes, but brought about because a neutron star, a pulsar, spins down and the crust stays put, that produces stress in the material, you don't have this, I'm sorry. I, I did a few new transparencies for this talk. But we can get them Xeroxed in and to you later. And what happens in a young pulsar is that these star quakes are responsible for the glitches you see in the crowd pulsar. That's young. And those happen, they're much smaller than the glitches observed for the Vela pulsar. They're only a few parts in a million. On the other hand, the, it is the pinning of the vortex lines, the rotating superfluid. We've tried everything else, and we come down to this rather complicated explanation, which is responsible for these extraordinarily large glitches that are observed in the Vela pulsar. You know what it's like. You think of a big earthquake, and things jump around a little bit. But Imagine being on that neutron star when it's glitched. It's equivalent to the entire radius of the Earth shifting by one meter. And it's, it's unimaginable in the intensity of the change. And that's why, of course, people didn't believe that that really could happen. But what's happening is just the fact that the superfluid in the star, which wants to spin down, is lagging behind because it's pinned. And these enormous glitches are its way of playing catch up. And what happens then is that you watch afterwards. You watch the long time delay afterwards. And what you find out is that you can identify various kinds of response to the glitch and tie them in detail to what goes on in the crust of a neutron star. So they're always playing catch up, the, the pin superfluid. And it's a way for the superfluid to keep up with pulsar spin down. And if you look at timing observations, we now have 25 years of these. You can not only explain all of the peculiar post-glitch behavior with this idea 
of creeping pinned superfluid, but you can also make a prediction. And we've been lucky, we've been able to do both. We were able to predict the behavior of the Vela Pulsar. We got the time of the tenth glitch almost exactly right, which is very unusual that you can predict anything in astrophysics. But even more amazingly, we were able to predict the nature of the pulse glitch behavior. So that we were able to kind of complete this circle, beginning with the proposal by Lev Landau that there were neutron stars. We were able to complete it by saying, not only do we know about neutron stars, but we know in detail about what is going on some 600 meters under the surface of a neutron star by our ability to time what happens, by our ability to predict glitches and understand their post-glitch behavior. Thank you.